it's really had an excellent start. Um, it's able to image human brains, whole human brains at cellular resolution uh, at a very significant scale and throughput, uh, which is one of the first of its kind in the world. And that data and that knowledge that's coming out of the data has truly attracted global attention. And in one way, the series of talks that you're going to hear today uh, are by people who have come here uh, as visiting faculty, working with the center, uh, making, uh, you know, taking leverage and of this data and insights and create more knowledge and insights out of it. And that's really what uh, you will hear about. Uh, but today's talk is actually not so much about the Brain Center by itself. We purposefully wanted to keep it that way. It is to give people a perspective of you know, how studying brains in different ways of different organisms, and you will hear what are those kinds, gives so much insights, not just about the organism itself, but about the world and about the way we interact with the world and how it shapes our behavior as much as it shapes the environment itself. Right? And uh, could not have had uh, you know, people of truly diverse disciplines, uh, starting from Dr. Vijay Raghavan, who has been you know, uh, working on this kind of work for like almost 30, 40 years after he had his chemical engineering background, I proudly tell people. Uh, and we have Dr. Susanna, who many of you may recognize from various TED Talks, where she truly is an excellent uh, science communicator, where very, very complex things which uh, she identifies, she's able to teach it to you know, even children. Right? Uh, there will be a quiz at the end of the day, so you may want to be careful. Uh, and we have Dr. Paul Manger. Uh, you know, the less I say, it's better, because you'll, you'll lose the suspense in the talk. Uh, and this is his fifth visit to IIT Madras in the last one and a half years. Um, not only because he likes the Tharamani Guest House food, uh, also because you know, he truly believes that you know, the kind of expertise and knowledge that he has uh, weds with the engineering and technology approach which we are taking in studying the brain. So with that, uh, you know, I will step away and please enjoy the rest of uh, the evening. And after that, the visiting faculty will be here for another two to three weeks. Uh, we have Bruno Mota, uh, who will not be speaking today because we didn't know whether he'll reach here on time. Uh, but you know, so he, they're all accessible to you over the next two weeks. So welcome and enjoy the show. Thank you, Professor Mohan. First on our agenda, we have the pleasure of hosting the esteemed Dr. Susanna Hukulana Hausel. Dr. Susanna is a Brazilian neuroscientist known for her groundbreaking work in comparative neuroanatomy. She holds a master's degree from Case Western Reserve University, a doctorate from Peary and Marie Curie University, and a postdoctorate from Max Planck Institute in Germany. Dr. Susanna's research focuses on understanding what different brains are made of, their energy consumption, and the cognitive differences across species. She is an accomplished author, university professor, and since May 2016, an associate professor at Vanderbilt University. Her discoveries, such as debunking the myth of 100 million neurons in the human brain and showcasing the impact of cooked food on brain development, have significantly contributed to neuroscience. Dr. Susanna has also explored gender differences in brain function shedding light on task switching abilities and spatial orientation preferences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susanna, a trailblazer in neuroscience, to share her insights with us today. Hello. Um, I am delighted to be here. So thank you so much for having me um, on my, I hope, just the first of many visits to IT Madras in Chennai. Um, I will give you a very brief overview of um, the work that uh, I've been fortunate and delighted to do over the, the last 20 years, thanks to my uh, the, the wonderful collaborators that I've been lucky to have as well. But I'm, I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to tell this story from the point of view of something that um, is you are much more familiar with than, than I ever was. Elephants, they're big, they're be beautiful, they're majestic. Um, we uh, 
and yet when we compare ourselves to them, it should become pretty clear that uh, they're much bigger than we are. They have much bigger brains than we have. And if brains are the organ that we use to think about life and to study other animals, including their brains, well, if elephants have bigger brains than we do, then how come aren't they in this room studying us out there in the, in the wild? And the answer that I'm going to propose is that cognition, or at least cognitive capabilities, what we are biologically capable of doing, each species, each individual, it shouldn't have um, as much to do with the size of the whole of your brain, but rather with how many units, how many functional processing units you have in your brain. And you can get an idea of the sense that that makes intuitively if you think of neurons as the Lego pieces that build brains. So so the more the functional units that you have, the more the possibilities that you have for what you can build. Also, the more flexible you are in what you can build and the more complex the, the whatever it is that you build can become. And that flexibility is incredibly important to me because I've come to um, believe that the best working definition that we have for intelligence comes down to that one word, flexibility. It's behavioral flexibility. So the more neurons that a brain has, all else being equal, the more flexible it should be in its function. And I'll get to that in, um, in a moment. So the if we play along, just humor me for uh, some 20 minutes, if you will. If we play along with this idea that neurons are the functional information processing units of brains, then if we want to compare brains like a human brain and an elephant brain, then what we really want to, to know is how many neurons does each of them have? Does an elephant with a bigger brain, does it really have more neurons than a human brain? And if they do, then we really have a problem um, because there's either we're wrong somewhere, we've made a huge mistake somewhere along the way, or there's uh, maybe humans are really special the way that uh, brains have been, our brains have been considered to be because of exactly that problem. How can uh, elephant brains are much bigger than, than, than ours, so ours must be better, all else being equal. Notice that all else being equal also assumes that a neuron is a neuron is a neuron, again, um, across species. So if you have a bigger brain like the elephant brain, it should have it should be made of more neurons, and which is the source of this big vexing problem. We expect elephants to be um, able to, to be more cognitively able than our species if we assume that a bigger brain must be made of more neurons. So is that true? Are they really? So open any textbook, and the majority of them to this day is still going to tell you that the human brain is made of 100 billion neurons. I started doing what, I, what I've been doing for the last 20 years exactly because um, I, I was a newcomer to the field, so I asked what to me was the obvious first question, who says so? Where do the data come from? Where, show me the numbers. What's the original reference? And I asked the best people I could think of asking, people who write, no, write the textbooks, including, and nobody had an answer. The, the best answer was always something like, well, that's what everybody says. Um, what, are you saying that's wrong? I'm like, I don't know, but uh, I guess we should look at it first. So the, I figured that um, that was a question that really interested me because having been, having grown up training in, in biology, I learned to think that, well, creatures are creatures made of, made of the same types of cells, so why should the rules of evolution apply to everybody but not to us humans? What's the story that the human brain is better somehow than any other um, brain? So I figured that the best way to, um, I figured that I, I knew a way to figure out how many neurons human brains were made of. And that was, 
uh, consisted of essentially dissolving those brains, like literally dissolving the, all the heterogeneities in the, in the tissue. And that's important because the usual method, what is to this day the golden rule for counting cells short of enumerating them one by one, um, is stereology, which relies on a sampling strategy that places um, dissectors, your probes in uh, different parts of the brain, but if the, what you see here is, is purple is the neurons themselves, the, the cell bodies of the neurons, and the different shades of purple that you see are due to the different distribution of neurons. There's a gazillion neurons right here, and you move one millimeter to the side, and there's very few neurons there. So um, you, anyway, you place your probes, and then you count cells within in how many cells you find in, inside that probe, hoping that this is going to be a simple math problem to solve. Well, there are many problems to, uh, until you can really consider that that's a simple math problem. You need impeccable histology. It's extremely labor intensive. You cannot lose a single section um, in, your, in your series, or you hope you don't. There's the problem of heterogeneity. There's an added problem that in some parts of the brain, you have incredibly high density of neurons, so telling them apart becomes very different, uh, difficult. Um, the recent game changer, based on thanks to technology, of course, is the possibility of automation of, uh, that allows you to count cells by enumerating them. Um, but it's still costly in, in many ways. So what I figured I could do is, well, uh, maybe I can literally dissolve this heterogeneity, as in I'll take this brain and I'll do away with all the cells. So now I have individual cell nuclei. In, in solution, and I can now, I can really just shake my suspension and sample and um, take small quantities, and any small quantity should be representative of the whole. So I had to give it a proper name, or the editors wouldn't really buy it in a journal, so that's the isotropic fractionator. It's really brain soup. You take a brain, um, and you fix it well, and then you dissolve it in detergent that does away with all the membranes, you end up with just the cell nuclei. This is the one assumption that you're making. As long as every cell has one and only one nucleus, then instead of, you don't need to count cells, you can simply count cell nuclei. And that's really advantageous because now that the cell nuclei are free in suspension, you can just agitate the suspension, and any sample that you get is going to be representative of the whole. Label your nuclei, and you can go to the microscope, and in a matter of 10 minutes, um, to this day, I can still beat automation, I'd like to point out. In a matter of 10 minutes, you can count, um, you can determine how many cells you had in your original sample. Give it a couple of hours to use antibodies, and you can determine what fraction of all those cell nuclei, so what fraction of all those cells, were actually neurons, as you see here. So you follow the recipe, which is very much like a kitchen recipe, like a cooking recipe. You take your material of, of choice. You cut it into the parts that are of interest to you. You want to do a whole brain? Sure, you can do it. But you can also dissect it into the parts of the, the regions of interest, like the full, the full cerebral cortex, which is what I'll be telling you about. You slice and dice it, literally. Then you crush it in detergent and turn it into a soup, a literal soup, which is from where you take your sample. So great. This worked in mice. This worked in, in rats, gave numbers that were similar to what, what few structures had been counted properly with stereology. So we were ready for, for the human brain. Does it have 100 billion neurons? Well, no. It has 86, which is where people would just roll their eyes at me and say, duh, 86, 100. It's very much the same, isn't it? Well, that's exactly the question. That's the important um, um, that's exactly the, the, what we want to know once we have the numbers. What does it mean that it's 86 billion neurons on average and not 100 billion? And um, 
there already, there's, you, we can notice something interesting in the distribution of all these neurons because the cerebral cortex, which is this main part of the brain that accounts for 82% of the mass of the human brain, look at those numbers, it only has 19% of all the neurons in the brain. The vast majority of neurons in the mammalian brain are actually located in the cerebellum, in the back of the, of the brain. And there's a very small minority of brain neurons that you will find in the brain stem, which are the parts of the brain that actually operate the, the body. So here's th this, this developed into a whole other interesting story of its own, how s impressively small is the number of neurons that actually operate the body of um, animals of different sizes. To give you an idea, we found that uh, the uh, 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 200 kilogram crocodile functions, it's, it's operated by exactly as many brainstem neurons as operate a, a whole rat, a tiny little rat. Which, by the way, was one of many things that were possible thanks to the collaboration with Paul Menger here in the, in the audience, um, started in 2009 when we published the numbers for the human brain and I wanted exactly to answer that question, so what? Um, how does the human brain compare, for instance, to an elephant brain? And I, I emailed Paul, I found that he had just published a paper on how to collect elephant brains, so I you know, I'm kind of shameless and clueless that way, so I just sent him an email asking, hey, cool work. Um, I see you have four elephant brains. Could, could I have half of one, please? Also, um, could I, I'll, I'll be turning that into soup. Is that okay? And so I, of course, got an email back saying, uh, no, they're too precious. What if I give you just a few pieces? And I'm like, well, two pieces, a few pieces and no pieces that, that's going to be pretty much the same because the, here's the list of reasons why it has to be done this way if we're, we're to um, get a significant estimate out of this. Thankfully, Paul was game, and uh, um, I think I'd, I'd like to think that that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship with tons of, new, of brains uh, being transported in suitcases like this. This, is, this was the, the bounty in, in 2012 after we collected uh, um, quite a few brains from quite a few artodactyls. And I point out that here's, this one is the elephant brain in the, in the bucket that um, we got all the appropriate permits so I could take it to Brazil and we could study. And I'd like to point out that um, th this science as a whole nowadays um, but especially this kind of science, this kind of comparative analysis, you need a network of, of collaborators. There's, it, 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 regardless of how much I could do on my own, that would be nothing without the network of collaborators all over the world that I was able to um, convinced, let's say, to submit the, the, the brains that they collected to being turned into soup in the name of figuring out how many neurons different brains are, are made of. So um, being shameless and clueless helps a lot at those moments. Just email people, hey, could I have one of those brains, please? Thank you. All right, so here's the elephant brain. Um, so the question now is how does the elephant brain compare to us? Well, that would be akin to comparing a mouse brain to a human brain and then, and then saying, well, we have fill in the blanks. What do you do with just two species? You cannot make any claims about what humans are like or how humans came to be from just comparing humans to mouse brains. Um, or maybe you throw in a monkey brain in the middle, which is what the literature had been doing for a number of very understandable reasons, but the point is that's not valid. You cannot make that kind of conclusions from just studying two species or, or three species. You need something systematic. You need to look at, uh, you need to sample diversity so that you can understand the patterns that apply. And then you can ask, does the human species fit 
whatever pattern it is that you would expect humans to, to, to fit. So let me give you a, a taste of what uh, we found out when, um, thanks to that, all those collaborators um, around the world, we were able to turn a lot of brains from 69 species and over actually into soup to then compare them. Well, let me start by showing you um, that uh, an L of, uh, a giraffe brain has about 1.7 billion neurons in the cerebral cortex, the, just the cerebral cortex here. A giraffe brain is about this size. Um, now, the giraffe cortex actually has about as many neurons as you find in the cortex of the rhesus monkeys out there, um, which is actually less than the number of neurons that you find in the pallium, the corresponding structure of the brain of a macaw that's actually even smaller. So lesson number one that you can take from this is that Brains are not all made the same, and size is not a good proxy, a good indicator of what you can expect in terms of how many neurons, how many units compose those brains. And uh, set lesson number two, there are different scaling patterns that apply to different types of animals. So when you take rodent brains of increasing size, what you find is that as the number of neurons increases in the brain of um, the, the rodent, those neurons, you see the, that's my very super fancy little green circles there, the more neurons, the more circles I draw, the bigger those circles are. Um, and in a way that's predictable enough that it can be described with power functions and that I can then just abstract to something like every time I get 10 times more neurons in a rodent cortex or a non-primate cerebral cortex, um, every time I get 10 times more neurons, I get a brain that is 40 times bigger, which all else remaining equal means that on average every neuron is now four times bigger for that kind of, for that scaling step. What about primates? Well, for for primates, you tell me. What I see here is that more neurons are not bigger neurons. And that is captured by the power equations that represent this relationship, which have a scaling exponent that is actually not significantly different from one, which means you have essentially a linear relationship, which means that if a, whenever, if a primate brain has 10 times more neurons than another, that brain is also 10 times bigger than the other other one. Next question, of course, what about the human brain? Are we that the owners of that linearly scaled up human brain? How do we determine this? Well, once we have learned patterns from studying diversity and on the other hand we have a human we have looked at a human brain we have determined the numbers then we can simply solve these equations for 86 billion neurons and we we can estimate we can predict that a generic rodent for instance that had 86 billion neurons in in the brain as a whole would have a brain of 36 kilograms that's an entire 10-year-old child. The entire child is a brain that does not exist in nature. The biggest brains we know are about 9 to 10 kilograms. Um, a brain that big would probably just be crushed under its own weight. So won't happen. Also, because that brain of 36 kilograms in a generic um, rodent with 86 billion neurons would belong in a body the size of a blue whale. So we know already that that giant rodent would have to be aquatic, which means that first, we are not rodents. Second, we also don't have to worry that much about rodent mutations that created um, huge rodents because large as their brains would be, they would still not have a whole lot of neurons. Next question, what about a primate, a generic primate with 86 billion neurons? Well, it would have a brain of about 1.2 kilograms, about right, in the body of some 60, 70 kilograms, also about right, which means 
that we come to the oh so surprising conclusion that we are primates. I am a primate, every single one of you is a primate, which should not be a um, surprise at all. Uh, Darwin was a primate, and Darwin had a primate brain, um, which was really not special as, as, at all. So we need an elephant, enter Paul, with uh, one hemisphere of an, uh, an elephant brain that he kindly agreed to donate to the um, to be turned into, into soup. Um, this is me in 2013 holding the, the, the elephant brain out of a minus 20 freezer and that look on my face is this is incredibly cold, just take the picture already. Um, so that we could then section this brain into multiple, into different areas that we could then sample one by one so that we would also have at least some spatial information on where the neurons were distributed, where they were concentrated in the elephant brain. So the result we published in 2014 in this, this paper where we found that, um, lo and behold, the elephant brain does have more neurons than the human brain. Ha! Ah. But the enormous majority of those neurons, and we're talking 98% of those neurons, are located in the cerebellum which means that the cerebral cortex is only left with 5.6 billion neurons. So it's a twice larger cerebral cortex with only one third the number of neurons that you find in the human cerebral cortex. Why do we care about that? Why the, the, why, um, the cortex, the number of, why, why would the number of neurons in the cortex be relevant for explaining the cognitive differences between our species? How come we are humans in there and elephants are out there? Well, um, what does the cerebral cortex do is, well, it doesn't run the body. It's the, the, the rest of the brain stem that, that really runs the body. What the cortex does is, it receives copies of everything that goes on in other parts of the, the brain and integrates them, puts them together, creates new associations between the representations of events out there and also associations across the events, the internal events of the brain itself. So it finds associations that weren't there before. It creates new patterns that didn't exist until then. They only exist in your mind. They only exist in your cortex. So that is what gives flexibility because this cortex now is capable of modifying behavior. It can change the way that uh, the body is controlled and the way that the body acts. So behavior with the cortex becomes flexible. Part of that flexibility is generating complexity, which translates in for, uh, is manifested, for instance, in adaptive behavior, but also predictive behavior. You can plan your actions um, based on what you, what, you, what you can anticipate that will happen. You can learn from your past. You can keep a representation of your past experiences, and you can use those to simulate possible futures that then you can use to make your decisions. You can also, you can represent not only your own state, but, but also other people's states, which means that you can internalize other people's minds and act according to what you can predict that they will want, that they will do, or how they will react. You can, you can take others into consideration when, um, in, when you build your behavior um, to the point where we can interact and cooperate and build joint culture that transcends the individual. We can still, we can, we can build technology that gets passed on. All of that, if you think about it a little bit, I think um, is very well captured by the simple term flexibility. So this is, this is in a nutshell why I, th I think that when we use the word, the term intelligence, we're actually talking about behavioral flexibility. All right, so what we have is um, we have three times the number of neurons approximately compared to an elephant in the cerebral cortex. And what that makes us is the species that has the most neurons in the cerebral cortex. You see that, however, we fall on the same line with, with other primates, um, which 
like I said, makes us just a bigger um, scaled up primate. Here's the, the elephant and we can, our, our predictions and data um, about to be published show that cetaceans, so dolphins and whales, they also fall on the same line that you have for non-primate species, which shows you that if you look at the numbers here, the vast majority of animals out there, they have fewer than one billion of those signal processing units in the cerebral cortex. To have more than one billion, either you are a very large mammal or you are a primate. All right, so what? We have all these neurons um, that if they're the, the signal processing units that underlie cognition, great. Maybe that is, that it could be as simple as it, as it, it needs to be. We have more neurons, we're more intelligent than elephants, yay. Um, I think, however, the story is much more complex and much more interesting than that. So let me tell you why I think so in two minutes. Along with more functional units comes a requirement, a true re fundamental requirement for more energy to run um, a bigger brain and more time um, not only more time to run, but so one aspect of that time is more time to be able to afford that bigger brain that comes in a bigger body. So humans, if, they, if we ate like generic primates, we should eat more than uh, nine hours per day, and, um, which is, would already be impossible considering the, that there's, there's a fixed 24 hours in the day, eight to nine of them we spend lying down. An elephant can only be an elephant if it stays awake most of the day because it needs to eat 17 to 18 hours per day to be able to, um, to, be able to afford to get all the energy that it uses. So, but uh, the, given that humans have changed the way we eat, and that was a massive technological cheat in our, in our evolutionary history, we started modifying our food before we put it in our mouths, we started cooking. Um, the, so we can get, instead of spending nine hours per day eating, we can get, let's be generous here and say that each of us fending for ourselves, we would have to spend, let's say, two to three hours a day eating. That means that we have 12 free hours per day to do whatever we want with those neurons. An elephant has, at best, four hours, four free hours um, of, of waking time per day. And let me just point, uh, draw your attention to this relationship here that we found along the way. What you're seeing here is that the more neurons uh, uh, an animal, a mammal has in the cortex, the, the less it sleeps, the less it needs to sleep per day, which means that in, evo in evolution, as animals, primates included, started getting more neurons in the cortex. More neurons in the cortex comes with more time awake, meaning more time that you can solve the food pro problem, the energy problem, and then move on to bigger and more interesting things like finding problems to solve, especially now that you have all those neurons in the cerebral cortex. But most importantly, with more neurons comes not only more waking time, but also more total time to use those neurons. And that is what you, that's, that's the implication of these graphs here that show you that the more cortical neurons a warm-blooded animal has in its cortex, the longer it's going to be a child, the longer until it reaches sexual maturity, notice that humans are right there on the line, nothing special about us. Our human childhood did not become overly long in human evolution, but most importantly, the, um, the, the, the lifespan of a warm-blooded species is a simple function of how many neurons it has in the cerebral cortex, and again, that's our species right there. So with more neurons come in the cortex comes a longer life. Why is that important? Because that cortex is not born done. It self-organizes as it um, interacts with the environment, as, in, as it probes itself and ends up shaping itself into something that now 
actually has meaning and it has your meaning that um, applies to your reality. And this process of shaping of self-organization of the, the, the brain that shapes the brain of every individual is the process whereby we turn biological capabilities into your actual abilities. Um, that's what we do when we come to school. So once as we do this, and especially as we have more and more time to do that, we get to the point where we actually start developing technologies, processes, methods, solutions, algorithms, systems that solve problems faster. And what do they do? They give us more free time. I urge you to watch um, Hans Rosling's TED Talk, which to me is the best Ever. It's just nine minutes where he explains why he thinks that the washing machine is the most transformative piece of modern technology. Um, because he saw the washing machine give his mother time to go read books, time to go learn another language, go to the library, read with him. Um, and the other thing that you gain with free time is you gain the possibility of cultural transmission, which you get um, the, which if you put together with the history, the story of human evolution, what you have now is not only the, the story of human evolution is not only the human brain getting bigger and bigger, but actually human childhood lasting longer and longer. And maximal human lifespan increasing over as the um, over the last two million um, two million years starting with the advent of these simple technologies that shaped completely our our time budget so let me wrap everything up what we have here is uh, a story where um, the more cortical neurons a species has, the more time it stays, it spends awake, the longer it takes to develop, the longer it lives. Maybe as you, uh, you find a species that, has, that managed to have even more neurons in the cortex, maybe it gets to the point where it develops technology, get even more neurons, and now the technology is significant, uh, gives you significant amounts of free time, get even more neurons in that cortex, and you start now to have significant generational overlap that allows you to build a culture because now you don't have to create your own technology. You don't have to reinvent the wheel at every new generation. You overlap with those before you and you overlap with those after you, um, it, which is exactly what universities are about. Families first and then universities take over with, with this, uh, um, giving us the opportunity of having exactly what we have here, which is multiple generations in the same room where we can talk about what we We've learned. So elephants have bigger brains. How come they don't study you? My answer starts with because you have the more cortical neurons, three times as many, but not just that. You live twice as long with as much as three times um, the amount of free time per day that you can dedicate to interesting problems. Um, and we have the ability, we have the capability and the time to transform those capabilities into actual abilities that build our culture and body of technology that we can keep alive, however, so long as we have science and education to keep the process alive. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Susanna, for that very... Uh very fascinating talk, quite a lot to think about, and it was, it was really, I mean, everybody in the audience was hanging on to every word that you were saying. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Professor Paul Manger. Professor Manger, a professor in anatomical sciences at the University of Witwatersrand, is a distinguished neuroscientist specializing in the neuroethology of African mammals. His research, spanning from small mammals to African elephants, investigates the evolution of brain and behavior across different species. Professor Paul established the Southern Hemisphere's first major brain bank, housing specimens from over 150 mammalian species. With a focus on comparative neuroscience, he challenges conventional thinking, proposing a thermogenetic hypothesis for the evolution of large brains in whales and dolphins. Professor Paul's career includes postdoctoral positions at prestigious institutions and a guest lecturer role at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. 
with an extensive publication record, including over 300 papers uh, with a H index of 52. His recent work expands into improving human sleep and conserving African savanna biodiversity, stemming from his foundational studies in comparative neurosciences. He also serves on the editorial board of prominent neuroanal neuroanatomy journals. We're very happy to have him again back in IIT Madras for the fifth time. Uh, the stage is all yours, Professor. All right, so Mohan wanted me to introduce myself a little bit more than these things with some fancy pictures because I've told Mohan a lot of different stories and he tends to like them. I don't know why, he's a bit weird like me, I think. And uh, so, so I, I did my PhD in Australia and I was studying platypus and echidnas. Uh, oops, wrong way. These guys, they, uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Hang on. How do I go back? Just a second. Yeah. So, so these guys, these guys here, the platypus, the duck-billed platypus, which many of you heard about, and it's, it's close relative to the echidna. We used to go out into the rivers and catch the animals with nets like old-time fishermen and dig the, get them out of the nets at night. And we looked at their electroreceptive system. And that was my introduction really to neuroscience, was catching these weird animals in the rivers in Australia and then studying their brains. About 21 years ago, I moved to South Africa and started what we call the Comparative Neuroanatomy and Sleep Lab. So we work on brains of lots of different African animals, and we also work on sleep in these animals. And we study many of the larger, iconic animals. Susanna showed you some pictures of some of the brains of these, and we've had Susanna over and had a lot of fun with that sort of work. And um, then we've also studied a lot of the smaller animals in Africa, things you may not have heard of. Animals like golden moles, which have almost no eye. Their eye is about half a millimeter in diameter. And then the, the hairy mole rats, which are also very visually regressed. This guy is what we call a greater cane rat. That's a rodent that weighs about six kilograms. They, they live in the cane fields in, in Africa. Nice large bats. Pangolins, which are the scaly anteaters and have the unfortunate reputation of being the most highly trafficked uh, animal in the world. And then what, what is locally referred to as rock, as rock rabbits, they're actually called rock hyraxes. They're, they're very, very closely related to elephants. Really unusual little animals, only three or four kilograms, but they're only a, a couple of cousins away from being elephants. And all this work, working on these different animals, has led me to have lots of work-related adventures. I, I kind of, I, I don't mind working in the lab, but I prefer to work in the field. I, I feel more comfortable uh, doing that because I grew up in, in, in the bush in Australia. I've been into caves, catching bats, and all those little, little orange dots you can see are all eyes of bats being reflected in the light drove my car up to the rainforest in the Congo, out catching animals in the middle of the, the rainforest, been in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, working on animals there, and in Greenland, catching seals while dodging icebergs, and on whaling boats off of Iceland. While they were harpooning whales, I was harvesting brains from these animals. So I've had a lot of different adventures and had a lot of fun. And I could tell you stories about all these different animals and all these different adventures all day. And, um, but that, that would just get boring, I think, for everyone. It is a lot of fun for me, but maybe not so much for everyone else. But this work has led to some sort of highlights that I want to bring before getting into one I really want to talk about. With the work on platypus electrosensitivity, what we discovered was that the platypus was sensitive to about 50 micrometers per centimeter, microvolts per centimeter, a very small amount of electricity they could detect. One of the major problems in Australia at the time was that the platypus they were taking into zoos to exhibit were all dying within a couple of months, and they couldn't get any animals to breed. So after a little while of working on these animals, we cottoned on and said, hey, we just need to put a Faraday cage around where these animals are living, ground that, and immediately the platypus were happy, happy in this area. Within six months, the first zoo that followed our recommendations were breeding these animals in captivity. So it made a huge change to these animals. Now, while they're not endangered, the possibility that you can breed them to, to repopulate areas that where, where they have been uh, wiped out is, is really quite important. 
One of the things that I've become very infamous for is, is saying that dolphins and whales aren't intelligent. Yes, they, have, they do have a bunch of neurons, but it's the way those neurons are organized that is not so great. And it led to a new concept about brain evolution on whales and dolphins related to the environment in which they live in thermogenesis. And with the work on the, we've done on elephants has shown that elephant communication is far more complex than what we previously thought. In fact, the elephants can use their infrasound to three-dimensionally localize sound in space. And then they use their heads as a Helmholtz resonance chamber to create the infrasounds. So I could go on and on with all these different stories and how the brains show us they're doing this kind of thing. But one of the, the things that I often get la asked a lot is what does all this comparative neuroanatomy mean? What does this mean to people? So I've got a kind of a, 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 an unusual sort of um, title here. Oops. Excuse me. There we go. Okay, an unusual kind of title. Can a com comparative neuroanatomist contribute to solving humanity's self-induced existential crisis? If you, if you have taken your head away from the cell phone for five minutes, you will know the Earth is in a terrible state. Humans, we, what we've done has caused global warming, a rapidly changing environment, and if we don't change what we're doing, by summer of 2040, there'll be no ice in the Arctic Circle. That's a huge problem. There's been a quadrupling of novel zoonotic diseases. In Africa alone, 1.6 times increase in zoonotic diseases that have, have arisen. It's only a matter of time till something really contagious and really deadly appears. There's been major increases in economic equality. In, in Africa alone, almost half a billion people live on less than 150 rupees a day. So that's quite a lot of people that are very, very poor. And we're in the midst of the sixth major extinction event. By 2100, if we don't change what humans are doing, we're gonna lose half of all species. That's more than species than we actually even know that exist. There's so many species that are undescribed yet we're gonna lose them before we even know that they existed. So my lab is the African savanna ecosystem at the moment. That's where, I, where I'm happiest, that's where I like to do my work. I say this is my lab, the experiment is evolution, and I try to describe what's going on and how to use this kind of information in a positive way. The whole ecosystem itself is a very large carbon sink. It contains about 5% of the, it, it covers about 5% of the Earth's terrestrial surface, and it stores about 4.5% of global terrestrial carbon. The majority of this carbon is stored in fungi that are lying under the ground. So fungi are incredibly important. If we protect this ecosystem, we'll prevent the movement of all this carbon into the atmosphere and a healthy ecosystem can actually store more carbon, mitigating human climate change. It's also home to a diverse biological assemblage. We've got the iconic species, but we also have hundreds of thousands of species that we don't even know yet exist there, the microbes, the fungi, plants, and so on, that we don't know that are there yet. We haven't found them yet. And the bio, but this biodiversity also creates the potential for a whole host of novel zoonotic diseases that could be really damaging to humans. So one of the things that, because I kind of feel a bit of ownership maybe in that, that weird ownership way we have, I don't feel like I own it, but we have that ownership and, and affection for, for our, our territories. Um, I really think it's, it's worth saving this ecosystem in a lot of ways. And this ecosystem is under imminent threat. By 2050, in sub-Saharan Africa, there'll be more than two billion people. So yes, India has the most people now, not for too long. Um, the landscape is being altered for mining, for human settlement, with agriculture and the mining that comes along with it. In particular, lithium is one of the metals that's really needed for the green revolution. 
excuse me, the African savanna ecosystem <coughs> contains enough lithium to power the entire green revolution. So while it's incredibly plentiful and great for the green revolution, if it's not mined carefully, we'll destroy this ecosystem. There's many animal populations that are in serious decline already, and there's many increasing incidents of human-animal interactions and conflict. And normally, the animals get off worse. In this case, it's kind of nice to see an elephant win against a vehicle. So if we're going to save the African savanna ecosystem, we need a shift in our paradigm, the way, the way that things are done by humans interacting with, with environments. We need large-scale interventions. We have to look at saving entire ecosystems, not just individual species. Saving individual species is obviously important, but saving ecosystems can save hundreds of thousands of individual species. And most importantly, humanity's priorities need to change. We've spent, we're, we're, as a species, we're incredibly self-absorbed. We're really interested in ourselves and the betterment of ourselves. And for a while, for our own benefit, we have to step back from our immediate desires and wants and say for our long-term survival, we need to change our priorities. And by saving ecosystems like the African savanna, you can help to mitigate human-induced climate change, lower the risk of new diseases emerging, create opportunities for local development, and preserve biodiversity. So how am I going to do this? This is, this is my plan, and I'm kind of throwing out my plan and my ideas here. I want to talk about the plain zebra. This is one of the most interesting animals that I've ever seen. And I've looked at a lot, lots of different animals. The plain zebra has become the top of my list in terms of what's interesting. It's one of three species of zebras. It inhabits the African savanna ecosystem. It has two non-migratory home ranges, a northern one and a southern one that are about 500 kilometers square each. Um, which is an order of magnitude larger than most other species in, the, in this region. And these two home ranges are linked by migration routes of 200 to 300 kilometers. In Africa, we know of four migrations at the moment, two in South Sudan, the famous one with the wildebeest in the Serengeti, and then one in Botswana where the zebras go on their own. In South Sudan, we have different species tagging along with the zebras. They, they lead all the known migrations. They're the first species to arrive along the, the migration paths, and they appear to remember those paths. It's a perissodactyl, which means its scientific classification as having uh, one hoof, or three, three hoofs, sorry. And it has a complex brain. The brain of the plain zebra has the largest known hippocampal formation. And the hippocampal formation is the crucial structure in our brain for spatial navigation. It tells us how to get around the world that we live in. So if we look at the, the, the size of the plain zebra hippocampus, sorry, we can see that it's above and beyond all measures of other, other mammalian species, including humans and elephants. It's three times bigger than you would expect for its brain size. So it has this really unusually large hippocampus why would this animal, of all the animals, have this unusual hippocampus? For those that are really into neuroanatomy, we can see the dorsal hippocampus here and the ventral hippocampus sitting over here. The dorsal hippocampus is highly expanded and convoluted. And this is a really interesting region of the brain because the dorsal hippocampus houses the neurons that are called place cells. Place cells tell you when you go from one place to another place, to another place, and so on, allow you to know where you've been and help you to plan where you want to go in the future. They're incredibly important for navigation. And you can see that, <coughs> excuse me, unlike most mammals, there's a lot of gyri and sulci in the hippocampus. And that really doesn't occur in a lot of other animals. Even in the mountain zebra, which is very closely related to the plain zebra, it doesn't have the sulci and gyri in the hippocampus. But I can tell you all these things, but showing you is the best way to go. So here's a little movie of how the, 
how the, the wildebeest are all coming together on their migration. And right up at the front here, you can see a few zebras are guiding the wildebeest, telling them where to go. They're really bringing a huge amount of wildebeest together. And you can see on the other side of the creek line here, the wildebeest are all coming together. There's one little zebra there, but there's some more up here. And you can see them all coming together. And the zebras, there's about nine of them there, I believe, or eight or nine there. Eight or nine zebras up the front here are guiding well over a thousand wildebeest. So the zebras are really the animals that lead the way on these migrations. I'll play that again because uh, it's sometimes seeing it in the first time, not so easy. And you can see the way the zebras are really saying, don't go down this creek bed, go this way. The others are saying, go in between us. And they're really guiding this mass migration. And this happens in all the different migrations that we've seen in Africa. Oops, sorry. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the next slide. There we go. So having this information, I came up with the idea of what I call Project Plain Zebra. So it's aiming to save the African savanna ecosystem and hopefully helping to save the planet from, from what we do as, as, as humans. With the research that we need to do, we recognize that the zebra is the key species for developing an understanding of how this entire ecosystem works. If we find new and understand known migratory routes, their connectivity, we can really get to a great, uh, a detailed understanding of the ecology of this whole ecosystem. And when we understand how this ecosystem works, we can conserve it and we can manage it. And uh, it's, it's, we can do this in several different ways. So this is the, the region of Africa that I'm talking about, the savanna ecosystem. It's about the size of the continental USA. We need, to, we need to contextualize the neuroanatomy. This is all doing a lot of basic science, including neuronal numbers, which I've recruited Susanna to do. Uh, we look at sleep and the migration for different ways, understanding how the animals are sleeping while they're migrating and how that contributes to the migrations, how smell and sight are used by the, by the zebras during the migration how the plain zebras lead the mass migrations and reveal all the migrations on the savannah. And this is where I've recruited Mohan, uh, Kirti, and Jairaj into the project because of their computing expertise and, and their analytical expertise as well. And plus, they're fun to be around. And to understand whether the migrations are individual units or they're, or they're genetic clusters. Does one migration, is one migration related to another? On this, on this whole area here that I've sort of squared out, there's room for about between 30 to 50 more migrations on the African savanna. So how are they related to each other? And then lastly, we have to make sure that the, the plain zebra population is healthy and viable. If you're going to build a conservation plan around the zebra, it has to be a healthy and viable population. <clears throat> so if we can preserve this ecosystem, it will help contribute to mitigating human-induced climate change. So the area that we're looking at is about 7.6 million square kilometers. It's not a small area. It stores about 100 gigatons of carbon. At the moment, humans are emitting 6.3 gigatons of carbon per year. So if we protect this environment, we'll prevent the release of 100 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. If we don't if we allow that uh, carbon to be released into the atmosphere, we're like being 15 to 20 years in the future without having done anything about being carbon neutral or so on. And a healthy ecosystem can actually store even more carbon. So that's in the way that it can mitigate carbon, carbon release. It also lowers the re potential risk for the emergence of new zoonotic diseases. In Africa, the zoonotic diseases we all know about are HIV, Ebola, hemorrhagic fevers, the respiratory syndromes, monkeypox, Marburg virus, West Nile virus, African trypanosomiasis. But just imagine an Ebola virus with the transmissibility of COVID. An ecosystem under pressure with viruses that are under pressure will evolve, they will adapt, and they will jump hosts, and they will be quite dangerous. So it's not, not a great thing to imagine. But also, by conserving this ecosystem, 
we can create re opportunities for human development, regional human development in the region. It's not going to be worthwhile for the people living there to not actually have the benefit of it. And ecotourism is one of the great ways that can actually improve the lives of the people there while they value conservation of the environment they're living in. And lastly, we can contribute a lot for preserving biodiversity. As I said, there's hundreds of thousands of species. With the plain zebra as the key species, their home ranges, their migratory routes, you can designate those as, as conservation corridors. And it will not only conserve the plain zebra, but the entire ecosystem, because the plain zebra is the animal that sort of dictates how this ecosystem works. It's the migrations of the zebras that make this ecosystem work. That has a knock-on effect to all animals, plants, microbes, fungi, etc., that live in this ecosystem and, and are dependent on the migration of survival. And this will ultimately lead to a novel paradigm for conservation of this ecosystem, one that isn't being worked on at the moment. So this is a, I've sort of gathered a team together. We're still at the very early stages of this project. We have people from the USA, including Susanna. We have people from different countries in Europe. We have Mohan, Kirthi, and Jairaj here that are going to lend analytical expertise that the rest of us don't have. And a cluster of scientists in Africa as well. Um, so we have quite a broad team, everyone bringing their individual expertise into a much broader project that was hopefully going to be uh, quite useful in the future for everyone. I'm at the beginning stages of fundraising. I need to raise about $62 million to do this. And most people will look at $62 million and say, wow, that's a lot of money. Yes, it's a lot of money. To me, it's a lot of money. As an individual, to you as an individual, it's a lot of money. But to humanity, it's not a lot of money. The amount of money that's spent on war, that's spent on, on, on other things, exploring deep space. Yes, exploring deep space is great. I, I, I love reading about cosmology. But maybe we need to take a little break from pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into those things and clean up our planet before we get back to that. That's why I say we need to, to, to sort of change our priorities a little bit. And we, when we talk to, to potential partners and donors, they can sponsor by sponsoring specific parts of the sub-project or donating resources, services, or equipment that's needed. And there will be substantial advertising equivalency value and tax breaks for, for the donors. So this is, this is a sort of a pitch that I'm giving to, to many of the donors that I speak to. But what I've hopefully convinced you of is that comparative anatomy can be really useful. It's more than just fun stories. It can actually be applied to improve our lives, not in the short term, but in the long term. Our children's children's children, and so on. We have to kind of think ahead, because if we don't, by 2100, the Earth is going to become quite uninhabitable, which is unfortunate, but it's the truth. So if we observe and understand neuroanatomy and the behavior of the different forms of, of life on the planet, we can actually start to understand the ecosystems and come up with more tangible ways of understanding these animals, conserving their ecosystems, rather than just having hypotheses or anthropomorphizing the animals. And anthropomorphizing is a real problem in the comparative research. And Project Plain Zebra is just one example of what we can achieve if we sort of look at animals in a different way to what we do in the standard laboratory setting, which is how can we use animals to help humans in a very direct, linear way, but we need to think in a broader scope and, and get rid of our linear thinking and think how can understanding the animals improve humanity across the entire globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for sharing your expertise with us. I'm sure everybody is looking at zebras with like newfound respect, and everyone wishes you the very best. Our next speaker is none other than, other than Dr. K. Vijayaraghavan. Dr. Vijayaraghavan is a visionary scientist with a passion for unraveling the mysteries of the brain and nervous system. His journey began with a Bachelor of Technology in Chemical Engineering from IIT Kanpur, 
followed by a PhD in molecular biology from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He then honed his skills at the California Institute of Technology before returning to India to establish the National Center for Biological Sciences, which has become a hub for cutting-edge research. Dr. Vijay Raghavan's research has not only illuminated the intricate workings of the nervous system, but also held the potential for translating his discoveries into medical applications. His dedication to science and his commitment to public service have earned him numerous accolades, including the Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Prize, the Padma Shri, and a fellowship of the Royal Society. In 2018, Dr. Vijay Raghavan was appointed as the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. In this role, he was responsible for providing scientific advice to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet on a wide range of issues including science, technology and innovation. He also played a key role in the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Vijay Raghavan was also the Secretary of Department of Biotechnology, DBT India, from 2013 to 2018. Please join me in welcoming a true pioneer in the field of neuroscience, Dr. K. Vijay Raghav. Um, thank you very much for that uh, long and generous introduction. I should now end my talk and say any questions. <laughs> um, um, but thank you. Um, you know, it's, um, uh, we've had two fantastic talks, but all good things must come to an end. Uh, so I hope I will do some justice to the uh, wonderful science we've just heard. Let me... Yeah, so um, thanks once again. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'll try to make up for lost time. Um, the, we've heard fantastic talks on how neurons in specific parts of the brain make for a variety of different kinds of behavior. And we've also heard a, a terrific talk on the importance of comparative neuroanatomy not just in understanding how different brains work, but how that can have a great impact on behavior in ecosystems and impact on ecosystems and what we can do. So let me get started uh, with the three questions biologists ask. And those three questions, no matter what you're working on, needs to be at the heart of the work we do. And the first question is, where did it come from? and that is evolution. And the second question is, how does it work? And that's physiology or biochemistry, uh, whatever you want to call it, to examine function. And the third is, how is it made? And that's developmental biology. And we study different problems across uh, scale using these three kinds of approaches. But there's another fundamental aspect of the work we do as biologists related to the first question about where we where, where we came from. Now, all life on Earth has a common origin, and if that's the wall of time equal to zero, if that's the start of the origin of life, all life has a common origin, and through evolution, therefore, there is a shared chemistry. And there is a shared chemistry which is linked through the thread of DNA. And therefore, studying any organism can have extraordinary impact on the understanding of any other organism in ways which are so wonderful to behold, uh, but are constantly surprising us again and again, though it shouldn't be a surprise because we know that this has to be the case. So we can try to understand cancers or brain diseases by studying cancers or brain diseases, but we may also find solutions by studying bacteria, plant, or any other organism. So this is, for example, a um, picture from Daniel Cronauer's work um, showing different um, ants, all belonging, all having essentially the same genotype, but who grow dramatically different and perform different functions because of the way the environment impacts on the genome. Well, what I'll talk today is not about elephant or dolphin brains or human brains, but how small brains give rise to complex minds, as it were. And I use the word mind uh, loosely. Um, we've heard a lot about large animals, but small animals, such as insects, actually occupy most of the um, mass of uh, most of the mass of animals uh, today on, on the planet. And insects 
occupy most of that mass. Uh, we must keep in mind, however, that 10,000 years ago, humans, uh, our pets, and our livestock constituted 0.1% of vertebrate biomass. And today, humans, our pets, and our livestock constitute 98% of vertebrate biomass, bringing into uh, focus the point which Paul made about how we have changed the planet. We have become, you know, from people surviving on the planet to those who sort of hold the paintbrush to shape the planet, and that's a big responsibility. On the left is a termite hill in Australia, um, and there are similar termite hills in India, and it's extraordinarily similar in structure to the cathedral in Barcelona shown on the right. Now, the left is an example of how a small brain, through extraordinary competence and interaction with other you know, beasts with a small brain, can build this structure, and how, on the right-hand side, an architect uh, with a maniacal zeal can develop a similar-looking structure on a much larger scale. So there's a difference between comprehension, which the termites don't have, uh, which uh, Gaudi, the architect, had, uh, and competence, which the termites have on scale. Now, one of the organisms which has really been absolutely wonderful in understanding how these small brains work, uh, again, because of the uh, value of comparative studies, is the fruit fly, uh, Drosophila melanogaster. Its genetics, it's a, your, our ability to make mutations easily, breed them in the lab, and look at behavior, development, function, and so on has been tremendous. But recent changes in our ability to develop the entire connectome of the nervous system to be able to chart out the path of every single cell and how it's connected to all its partners, link that with function has been absolutely transformative. And I'll very briefly talk about two aspects of the fly's behavior. One is walking, and the second is flight. And this is, in some ways, very, very pertinent to the wonderful work going on here at the Sudha Gopalakrishnan Center, because many of the challenges which we have in doing something on a human brain on scale have been met at a small level in the fly's brain. And the question is, is that ever scalable? And if so, how? And if not, why not? And what can we learn in components which are not scalable by moving between one organism and the other? So let's first go to walking. Uh, the fly uh, is amazingly good at sensing its surroundings, smell, taste, temperature, wind, and so on, and then moving not only flying, but also walking in different ways. And it does this in an extraordinarily uh, complex way, moving six legs, unlike famous Brazilian footballers who move two, but they do that in a tremendously uh, impressive manner. The fly does this. Fly can play football too. And um, it does it upside down, unfortunately. But while it moves its legs, and this is in slow motion, you can chart out how, what each and every leg is doing. And because we know from work in our lab and other labs where every single muscle in the leg is, and because we know how every single muscle is innervated by its motor neuron, we can predict by looking at this movement how which motor neuron is being activated or not, and which muscle is being activated or not. So by looking at the external movement of the fly, one gets an internal picture of what is activated. Now, not only is the motor neuron active or not, but it's active or not because it receives inputs from other descending neurons, which receive inputs from sensory neurons. So motion, which is the output of the nervous system, needs to be reconciled with the sets of neurons which are activated to develop that motion. And that's what we can do in the fruit fly. So you know this is the leg of the fly, and you, you can trace every single motor neuron in which muscle it's connected. Now there's another fantastic feature of the insect nervous system, which components of which are generalizable to larger nervous systems. 
And that is, while the insect brain has about 130,000 neurons, each can be divided into about 100 or so units or cell lineages. Each neuron is born from a stem cell, which gives rise to another stem cell and two neurons, and so on and so forth. And each lineage of these stem cells, this bunch of grapes, which you see over here, is related not only by birth, each neuron here is not only related by birth, but usually related by function. So you've passed down the complexity of 140,000 neurons to about trying to analyze, at least at first approximation, about 140 or so lineages. So these lineages also have been charted out, and this is a lineage of the motor neuron system, one, one of the lineages which contribute to the motor neuron system. And in the circle are the dendrites or the components which will uh, connect with other kinds of inputs. These dendrites can be examined very closely for each lineage and each neuron in a lineage and mechanistically understood how these patterns of arborizations develop and to which other inputs will come. And this is an exquisite neuroanatomical picture which can be translated into function because in the fly, you can manipulate each neuron, activate it or inactivate it, and look at the consequence on behavior. When um, um, Sahel Bidavi and colleagues in Christine Scott's lab did this and uh, looked at the function of a neuron called P9 over here, they found that when P9 was active, then you had a fly walking directly towards an object. So you show it an object, let's say it's a banana or something which is attractive, and the fly is static, and it will walk towards that not in a zigzag manner, but in this manner which is shown, uh, it'll take a curved line directly. And in other situations, it does this also, by the way, when uh, it performs its courtship ritual, when there's a female there instead of a banana right there. So in other situations, when it has to go to, to some other object, which is, uh, which is not courting, which is further away, it will go bolt really straight. And this other neuron, which when active allows it to bolt, other sets of neurons, is called the bolt neuron, named after Usain Bolt. Uh, so this is the fast walking neuron, the BPN neurons, th those sets of neurons activated. And this beautiful work, which is behavioral, which also activates or inactivates this neuron, can now be annotated by all the connections this neuron makes and receives, and this is uh, a picture of the sets of bolt neurons from, from fly wire, which shows how every single bolt neuron in the brain, and also there are other uh, pictures which I'm not showing you, which connect to this and, and tell us how the entire connectome is con uh, configured. So this connectome was done by taking serial electron microscopy sections and annotating them and ground truthing them to develop these kinds of uh, connections. And that was done over a 10-year period by uh, not just the core group, but by hundreds of people all over the world doing the serial annotations, many of them who were undergraduates. That whole project took 10 years. If you were to do that for one cubic centimeter of a mouse brain today, that would take 100 years. And for a human brain, it would take several hundred years. But technology is changing, both in terms of the speed by which automated serial electron microscopy can be done, and the data collected, and annotation. So these dates, these extrapolations which I have could be much less. Now, another aspect of walking, and then this is a very important value of model organisms such as the fruit fly, is because small circuits can be analyzed at the cellular level, linked to behavior in this manner, and because the components involved in nerve function, neurotransmitters, synapses, and their function and circuit behavioral output are, can be generalized in many ways. We can learn a lot. And there are more models of human disease in fruit flies, such as Parkinsonism, which can be used to, to study these diseases. And the genes which are involved in familial Parkinsonism can be studied in fruit flies and then screened for drugs as a, as a first effort before going on to other organisms. So here is a device which was developed 
in our laboratory, laboratory by Aman Agarwal. It allows the fly to walk up and down on the left-hand side, and that's shown hopefully over here. Um, you can see, oops. Don't worry. So on the left, there's a, you know, I can't show that. Yeah, so the fly can walk on this vertical white sheet which you see, and one can look at its gait. And what Aman did was something very interesting. He has now standardized this for both individual flies and groups of flies. But importantly, he started looking at fly gaits during development, right from the emergence from the pupa, in the normal wild-type fly and flies which are models for Parkinsonism. And he could detect at day zero differences in gait which so far have been seen only in a mature adult fly. And therefore, this allows the detection of gait variation at a much earlier stage. And he started a company, and that company is looking at gait in familial disease situations in humans uh, at very early, early stages to see how this can be uh, used. <clears throat> so it's long been thought that human development of gait, there's a capacity early on which is suppressed as the brain develops, and then that capacity comes back again. But recent studies, and this one by Dominici et al. in 2011, suggests that not only in humans, but in a wide range of animals, including birds, the capacity of, for gait is there uh, at fundamental levels right uh, after birth or emergence. And therefore, early evaluation of gait is often very valuable. And finer and finer methods of evaluating that can be very important. OK, now I'll quickly go to the next part of my talk about flight. And flight, again, is a very sophisticated capability of, uh, of uh, insects, such as fruit flies, dragonflies, and so on. Uh, dragonflies, for example, can mate in midair. We need an airplane. Um, but um, those kinds of capabilities are also critically important because even to fly straight from one location to another, a fly has to steer. And the circuitry for steering control is a very good example of control systems and engineering, which are very valuable in understanding how small circuit works. And if our brains and other brains are brains which com are, are composed of these kinds of control elements, we can learn a lot from these simple control circuits. So these are the main players, which I'll refer to again later on. But Zeeshan Ali in the lab has just started, along with Sunil Prabhakar, a major effort in trying to understand how steering can take place. Now here is an example of a uh, fly um, attempting to choose between four pillars, one of which has banana paste on it, and the other three don't. So it smells the banana, it sees various signs of the banana. It can sense the room, the environment, and the temperature. And look at the way its wing is flapping. It's not like that of a large bird or an airplane, uh, which has static wings. Uh, it folds its wings in an amazing manner, which actually hummingbirds also do. And it very carefully alights on exactly the wrong pillar. Uh, and it, it, it can make these kinds of interesting choices. Now, we used to study, we had studied for a long time, the powering of flight, how flight is powered. How, how does a fly beat its wings at a frequency of 250 or so hertz? But now we're trying to look at how a fly can hover. And this is the example of a hawk moth uh, and how it's ho hovering. This is about uh, sped up, uh, slow down 40 times. Uh, and this is a picture from uh, Sanjay Sane's lab. Uh, at the National Center for Biological Sciences. So the fly not only, the, and the moth, not only can it power the flight at high frequency, it can twist and turn its wings in a way by which it can stay in the same place. And this requires amazing agility in a system in which the wings have no muscles and, and the wings are not innervated. So it does this by moving the parts of the thorax to which the wing is attached internally 
and using a very small set of muscles and a very small set of neurons to do this control while getting sensors from the environment. So the powering of flight takes place by very large muscles shown here, and it flips the thorax up and down so that these muscles go back and forth. But the twisting and turning of the wing is done at the site where the wing attaches to the thorax. That's called the wing hinge. And if this plays, you can see this at um, slow speed in a larger fly. And you can see how that twisting and turning takes place. And this is also from Sanjay Sane's lab. The other structure at the back is called the halter. It's meant for balancing the fly when it does these complicated twists and turns and evades you when you try to catch it. And this amazing neural circuit is now amenable to study because, again, we have a complete detailed circuit map of every single nerve and where it connects. The sensory neuron, the descending neurons, other neurons involved in integrating uh, you know, inputs from a variety of parts of the brain right up to motor output. And that's what we are trying to do now. So we are trying to do that by studying the muscles which are involved in steering and how they're connected. And these are the muscles which we can look through an intact fly by using a method called micro CT, micro, it's an X-ray tomography. And this allows you to look at very fine structures without having to dissect open the animal as we used to. And we've developed, Zeeshan and um, uh, Sunil Prabhakar have developed tools which allow the looking of specific structures by genetic labeling while using micro CT. So we can get a construction of every single component. I'm showing the muscles here in some detail uh, and the attachment sites, but you can see that uh, for every structure, including the nervous system. Now, one of the very fascinating areas of work nowadays is what's called single cell RNA sequencing. And you can take a group of cells, dissociate them, and sequence gene expression in each of these cells. You can also look at proteomics. You can do other kinds of things. And you know, there are these techniques which yield a large amount of data. And a friend of mine once told me, a very senior scientist, that these techniques are the work of the devil. Uh, because they give you such an enormous amount of data that they distract you from the purpose you are trying to address, the question you're trying to address. At the same time, the devil's work is very interesting and exciting. Life is very boring if you don't sin a little bit. And therefore, it's important that you have access to single cell sequencing information, but use it wisely. Now, Ishwar Hariharan at Berkeley uh, has used it wisely. And he looked at the way by which the cells which give rise to the muscles and the wing develop and did a single cell RNA sequencing of that. And we looked at that data and identified those genes which are involved in making the steering muscle. And then we look at reagents which allow us to label these gene expression patterns in the developing fly and ask where they're expressed and ask, do they indeed have a functional role and not just a gene expression role? And the answer, short answer is yes, several of them do. Here on the left, you can see in red, some genes expressed which will give rise to the muscles involved in steering. And on the right, in green, are other muscles. So we've got tools now which can segregate the properties of different muscles in development, and similarly for the nervous system, and also through Ishwar's work for those genes which will give rise to the wing blade and its attachment to the thorax. So this is an example of how connectomics gene expression patterns at single cell resolution and function can be integrated. And the really big challenge, and this is the expression pattern of those genes, and the really big challenge we have today is the scalability of at least the gene expression and the neuroanatomy at high resolution. Function is much more complicated in humans. You can't you know, go back and manipulate genes in live humans. But you have a large human population where you can look at variations and see what's happening. And you have model organisms to see how genes specifically behave in cellular context. So I'd like to end by saying that for many years, we worked on how the muscles shown in red, the power muscles work. And now we're working on how the steering muscles uh, work, how their nervous system is controlled, and how 
their behavior is controlled in very complex situation. This work was done by Zeshan Ali, Sunil Prabhakar, uh, Krishan Badrinath, Sumeru Raju, who was an intern for a short period. And we we're greatly inspired by a comparative um, insect biologist at the um, National Center for Biological Sciences, Sanjay Sane, whose lab, uh, Aben Ghosh and Girish Kumar, did the uh, high, high resolution uh, movies of insect flight. And this is Shivani, who's now started looking at the nervous system uh, in collaboration with Zishan, who's looking at the muscles and the attachment sites. And this work was done at the National Center for Biological Sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vijayaragan, for that uh, very brilliant talk. Um, as we approach the latter part of our program, it's time for an engaging panel discussion. Joining us on the panel today is our distinguished alum, Mr. Chris Gopalakrishnan. Chris Gopalakrishnan, born in Kerala, India, is a distinguished Indian entrepreneur and philanthropist with a deep-rooted connection to IIT Madras. Co-founder of Infosys, a leading IT services company, Gopalakrishnan's influential role includes serving as CEO and vice chairman, contributing significantly to the company's global prominence. Beyond corporate success, Chris Gopalakrishnan maintains strong ties with IIT Madras, where he earned his master's degree in computer science. His association with the institute goes beyond his student years, as he has actively engaged in fostering collaboration between industry and academia. Gopalakrishnan's support for research and innovation at IIT Madras has had a lasting impact on technology and entrepreneurship in India. An advocate for advancing technology, education, and entrepreneurship, Gopalakrishnan's philanthropic efforts extend beyond Infosys, reflecting a broader commitment to societal development. His multifaceted contributions make him a key figure not only in India's business landscape, but also in the evolution of technology and education in the country. Thank you for joining us today, sir. Request you to please join us on the panel. I invite all of the other speakers onto the panel. Um, and joining today on the stage as a moderator for our session is uh, Dr. Richa Verma, the Chief Scientific Officer to the Brain Center. Thank you, Richu, and I thank all our speakers today for a wonderful session, and also thanks to the audience for coming here. I will first start with Chris, if that's okay. I know you told me it was a surprise. <laughs> and my question to you, you have played a pivotal role in supporting the brain research at our institute and India. I would like you to share your thoughts on what was your motivation, what's your vision, primarily in the Indian context, but also keeping the global context uh, together. First of all, I want to thank all the speakers today. Wonderful uh, presentation, very thought-provoking, different aspects. But uh, something that uh, connects all of them is about uh, our understanding of uh, brain, our understanding of uh, how uh, brain has evolved, it, how it functions, etc. And, and uh, at the end, you know, Vijay kind of brought it all together in the in the fruit fly. Uh, my interest comes from one, the need for uh, world class R and D research and development to happen in India because if India can actually find solutions to problem. Uh, of course, the problem gets solved. More importantly, the problem gets solved at lower cost. And, and the solution then becomes affordable to the 8 billion people in the world, not just the 1 billion people in the world. You know, any solution that comes from a developed country typically uh, is affordable to the top 10% of the population. Uh, but if India gets involved, I hope we will be able to reduce the cost significantly. Um, and this is uh, important in, uh, especially in uh, areas like healthcare, where uh, we still um, need to find cures for many diseases, like um, especially life lifestyle diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, etc. Uh, I have no doubt about uh, the quality of talent that we have. Um, it's a question of um, resources, money, um, motivation, uh, and and if we can provide all that, I believe that world-class research can be done. So an example I took was, of course, supporting brain research. Uh, and the reason is, again, um, you know, the brain is uh, 
one of the last unknowns. Uh, we still do not understand fully uh, how uh, the brain works, how um, you know it, it does all the things that it does, and and then at the and I'm hesitating to say at the top because um, more I understand, I, I realize that every brain is specialized on certain things and every brain has certain capabilities better than other brains, right? And I'm talking about different um, life forms. Um, but uh, let's say, you know, we look at human brain and trying to understand how it evolved and and understand then how we can address the some of the diseases of um, humans. Um, so that's what we are attempting to do through this support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My next will be Susanna. Thank you for the wonderful talk and how you compared where we as humans sit in the 69 species which you looked at. Since uh, it's also based, my question to you is based on the work which we plan to do. How do you think studying developing human brain are going to throw new insights of what you have been studying so far? Um, I think there's a, there's a number of very basic questions about how brains get to be the way they are. Um, and how all that complexity is built. So something that we've learned from looking at how's, how mouse and rat brains develop is that um, that's directly relevant to uh, what we have to learn from, from human brains is that um, if you look at the brain just at birth, you see as, about as many neurons as you find much later in the adult brain, right? So if you just, if you just compare those two time points, you might be tempted to interpolate between the two of them and just say, ha, huh, no, not much has happened. So development is simply this process of, yeah, and you're, you're born with already what you're gonna have. Well, if you, um, don't succumb to that temptation and actually look at what happens to the numbers of neurons, then you realize that right after birth, um, the number of neurons doubles, and then one week later, it gets slashed by 75%, and then it goes back again. Um, that goes going back again is what happens during adolescence. Um, mice and rats do have adolescence too. Um, so if you think of it from an evolutionary point of view, you might as you might say, this is pointless, this is wasteful, so it's got to really serve a purpose, right? Um, well, one of the things that you gain by overproducing, slashing, and reshaping is that's exactly one way to self-organize uh, uh, a structure, especially a super complex structure that is now um, undergoing that self-organization whilst uh, interacting with the, with the environment, right? Now, that's very different from what happens during gestation. During gestation, you have uh, you have a system that is is it's growing, so it's it's becoming progressively it's just gaining pro incrementally more more elements, um, which are going to be the, the the raw material for for what comes next. And there are fundamental questions that we still don't understand related to that, uh, to that, that development, that setting up, that growing uh, of the, the human brain before birth, which have to do with gestation itself. So starting with when are brains born? I mean, when, when, when are babies born? Uh, what determines when babies are, are born? Is it something about uh, the, the body itself, the brain itself, or is it something like what we suspect? Is it something that has to do simply with how much energy the mother's body is capable of supplying? How does that supply 
have to do with how many neurons the developing brain gains and how many neurons it will it will have at birth, which of course can impact cognitive capability. So by we don't know the first thing about these dynamics of how neurons form and how numbers of neurons form in the in the during gestation in the brain during gestation and what can affect that and how are they um, what are the, the 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 periods during gestation for instance that are the most vulnerable to to different and to different insults, especially those coming from the, the uh, that affect the mother's body, the mother's energy availability, and and that for um, I, I don't know what's what we're supposed to call them, developing countries like Brazil. I'm Brazilian, and uh, in in India, those are are particularly important problems because we realize now we've learned about the importance of nutrition for, uh, well, uh, adult well-being, also for, even for the well-being of the, ch the, the, the upcoming child, but nutrition, um, which can impact that developing um, brain in so many ways, and one of them is this link between the availability of energy and the, the growth of the brain, and then the health of that brain at birth, and also the duration of, of gestation and what relationship that could have to numbers of, of neurons. So that's, that's, that's just to, to scratch the surface. There are so many things to be gained by having that really basic information, right? Thank you. I think we are going to look at a lot of exciting stuff together. <laughs> My next question would be Paul. Paul, I know you picked your favorite animal, plain zebras, and we heard about it. But you have looked at so many species and their brains, which I don't think so anybody in the world would have looked at. If you had to pick any other species apart from this plain zebra, where you looked at the brain and you thought that's truly different or sim very similar to human brain, but it still functions very differently, which species would it be? <laughs> <laughs> that is such a difficult question to answer. That's okay. You should have warned me you were going to ask that. <laughs> and then I could have thought about it. I, I, I think every single species has something that's absolutely fascinating and, and interesting about it. Uh, I, that might sound like a cop out of an answer, but um, it's the truth. And, and looking at looking at a variety of species is is actually really important. A lot of um, shortcuts in our understanding of the human brain have been made by looking at different species. Uh, in the the 1940s, the action potential was described in a giant squid. Whereas nowadays, if you propose to a granting agency, I want to look at the giant squid to find out something about it, they would never give you the funding for that. It's not, uh, it's not molecular, it's not, not, the, the, not the done thing. And so, uh, so I think all, all the different species are really important to look at and find the really unusual things about them. So the, the zebra, the hippocampus is unusual. I wouldn't study the cerebellum in the zebra except passing, but um, the hippocampus is important and it can lead to things. There'll be other species where, where things are, are, are less developed, like the loss of vision in certain, certain species and how does the brain reorganize itself under the loss of a sensory system or the acquisition of a new sensory system like electroreception in the monotremes how does the brain reorganize itself? And in the monotreme brain, you get <coughs> um, the way electroreceptive and electroreception and touch come together is very much like the ocular dominance columns in, in human visual cortex. So we have these sort of systems and setups that there's commonalities and there's differences. And the different species start to really pull out these commonalities and potentially lead to really novel uh, novel model species for finding out new and really interesting things uh, about different brains. So in terms of a brain that would be the favourite, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't say that there's any. I think all of them are worthy of study, but 
the generally humans at the moment spend most of our time, at least 75% of our time, studying the brains of three organisms, the rat, the mouse, and the human. And that's, what is it, 0.0001% of all nervous systems on the planet. And I think by just looking at some of the others, we can come up with really amazing things. So uh, I've always felt that I, I don't want to work on humans, although you guys have convinced me otherwise. Um, the, the, because there's so many people already doing that. And there's such a diversity out there. If we don't appreciate and understand that diversity, we're actually lo losing out on something big for, for human culture. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. My next question would be to Professor Vijay Raghavan. Thank you for showing such detailed motor neuron connectivity. And when you were speaking about that, you spoke about scaling up and how do we go about with the human brain. Now, in a traditional way, most of the neuroscience studies have come out, out of wet lab and biological approach. Here at IIT Madras, uh, it's a very technology engineering approach which we have taken. I would like to hear your thoughts, both as a neurobiologist and as a policymaker. How, should, how can we do this in India? And how does this compare with the classic biological approach or in terms of understanding neuroscience or even the brain development? Thank you. Um, the close link between technology and neuroscience is not new and has been there for all of the history of neuroscience, whether it is in terms of and in biology, whether it's X-ray crystallography, um, you know, electrophysiology, MRI, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So, and sometimes it's technology impacting on the science, sometimes it's the science impacting on the technology. So that relationship is very strong. But what's happening today in biology is a revolution which requires both theory and the handling of information on a scale which is completely unprecedented. And the reason is that the tools of examination of biological systems uh, by microscopy, by you know, which includes anatomy and physiology through microscopy, through biochemistry, uh, and by looking at observation. You know, you can look at behavior on scale of cells to large organisms and ecosystems. So the amount of information we are getting from diverse systems, which link cells uh, to molecule, to circuits, to behavior, is absolutely astounding. Now that information wealth needs to be looked at and analyzed, so partly technology is going to be critically important in that, but also provides a wealth of theoretical approaches in a manner analogous to what the data from high energy physics uh, provides to theorists and how theorists impact the search in high energy physics and in cosmology and in astronomy and so on. So biology is moving from substantially an observational science to one which integrates mathematics, information theory, and theory itself to observation in a manner which is truly a revolution. You can argue that this has taken place several times before, but it's happening on scale now. For us, it means that no longer is it reasonable to say that, oh, I don't like mathematics, so I'll go and take biology in school. You have to take quantitative sciences right from the beginning. It's really going to be very important whether you're going to use it in you know, algebraic geometry models or in statistics or in information science. Uh, it's important to have a quantitative anchor to do biology. Um, I mean, it's more and more there. I mean, you don't have to have it all yourself. You can have collaborators, but that link is going to be important. Thank you. I'm just going to check time. Mohan, how are we going with time? Because uh, if we are okay for five minutes, and primarily with the, all our speakers, we'll just take a couple of questions from the audience. We didn't get chance. Hi. 
Hi, <coughs> sorry. Uh, my name is uh, Balu. I'm a, f a practicing psychiatrist from the U United Kingdom. So I wasn't supposed to be here. You know, I was here in pursuit of what Mr. Chris Gopalakrishnan was saying about finding low-cost solutions for my patients. And I just had my test at Apollo, and I was rushing, and then I found this slide, and I thought I'll just bump in. But I must tell you that this has been some of the, the most wonderful things I've heard in a very long time. And between two conferences in neurology, just to finish, I'm going to Indian Psychiatric Associate Conference in Kochi. But I'll come to my question. In my work, I deal with a lot of neurodiverse individuals. And I've made a very a rough calculation that we may have about a billion people in the world with neurodiversity, which includes dyscalculia, dyspraxia, ADHD, and uh, ASD. And I, I specialize in neurodiversity in workplace, particularly in the technology sector, because uh, some of these individuals have been extremely productive in, in terms of how they make their contribution to the technology sector. So I just wanted to find out from the neuroscientists if they feel that the neurodiverse brains have something which could be standardized. And you know, by definition, they're not standardized. Hence, they are neurodiverse. Because this could have a huge implication in how humans make decisions, particularly the executive functions. The way I see it is there's the disconnect between knowing what to do. All IITs and you know, institutions are very good at that. But doing what we know is what we are talking about today. So thank you for that. Was your, yep, Susanna, go for it. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the, you've pretty much given the answer already that, that I would give, which, which is that the problems are so diverse. The only way to handle that is with diversity itself. So figuring out what people do so well in developing technology and then extracting that and, ex and uh, simply just giving that to everybody else or making everybody else the same way, then you're losing everything else, uh, which are, are exactly the, the solutions that we might need to um, do everything that those, that very particular group of atypical people are, are good at. So um, I, I think the, the, the key there and everywhere else is just diversity, cherish diversity, value diversity, because there's a whole other talk there. Um, life is not survival of the fittest, fittest. life is whatever works. And there's so many different forms of life, so many different forms of brains. That's what we were, we were talking about here. They all work in their own particular ways. And not a single one can be said to be better or worse than the other ones. Mice are definitely not worse than humans for having just 1,000th the number of neurons that we have in the cerebral cortex. Mice are doing perfectly well out there, thank you, with uh, their tiny number of, of neurons. It's just a completely different reality. They, they are very good at doing things that we are terrible at. So I, I think the, the, the message is there. Let's understand diversity in all forms, individual as well, and let's make the best of that instead of just trying to make everybody else function like whatever we deem to be best at that moment for whatever reason. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. OK, one more question, and then rest will be at the tea time. Um, good evening. Thank you for that, uh, those wonderful talks. My name is Sinduja Shankaran. I'm a professor of psychology at Sai University. Um, today, uh, Professor Paul spoke about um, saving humanity. And when we're talking about saving humanity, I think it's important for us to understand humanity. Um, so I'm coming from the field of social neuroscience and talking about how the environment would play a role in different neuroscientific aspects. So for example, ostracism is related to social pain, which is very much related to actual physical pain. So in your own work, anyone could answer this. So how much importance would you give to the role of the environment in understanding human behavior? Yeah. Um 
You know, um, the environment is critically important, um, right from the way a cell functions to the way, for example, humans function. And there's all often a view that, you know, for example, if you take diseases or conditions which are familial and which are attributed to a single gene, that it's a genetic, you know, problem which can be identified. And of course, genes play in those kinds of situations an important role. But even there, and as everywhere else, the cellular and the cultural environment are immensely important in determining what the phenotype, the presentation is. So that's one aspect. But there's another aspect which is fundamental. Uh, you know, so there's a huge variability in outcomes with the same genotype. But there's another aspect which we must keep in mind. When we talk about genes and environment, we completely forget in our conversations, quite often, the role of culture, right? and the tools that we make. I may be ghastly at crossing a road and surviving, right? And that could be either because of my upbringing, that I wasn't taught to take care, or because of my genetics or whatever. But the fact is that today we have technology, i.e. a pedestrian crossing and a street light, which can make an inept person like me safely cross a road, right? So, and that goes for many other kinds of aspects, like mathematics. I may be not very good at mathematics or pretty bad at mathematics, but with my phone and access to information, I can do things which otherwise I would never be able to do. So in other words, humans have created tools and capabilities which extend our you know, ability to do things far, far beyond the variations which are allowed by genes or environment. And that's something we should keep in mind. That of course feeds back into how we deal with diversity as we heard in our context, but also how we deal with possibilities which are extraordinary and that are you know, immensely capable people provided with the right tools which, who can do wonderful things. So uh, environment is very important, but environment extends to our cultures also. Thank you. Um, I know you guys are, we are just, uh, how about you take your question during the tea time? Yep, sorry. Thank you so much. With that, um, our event comes to a close. A big thank you to everyone for diving into these insightful discussions and contributing your thoughts. Special appreciation to our fantastic speakers, Professor Susanna, Professor Paul, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, and Mr. Chris Gopalakrishnan for sharing their expertise. Your active participation has made this event truly memorable. Let's carry the inspiration forward, fostering collaboration and innovation. Here's to future engagements that spark even more brilliant ideas. Thank you all.